All right. Well, here's our agenda for today. We've got two things that I want to accomplish today. And this will help us sort of set the, the context in which we do social ethics within the church today. The first is I want, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some things that have to do with our culture and sort of the background, the culture that we're working with. And then I want us to think a little bit uh, specifically in terms of ethics about the, the most common ways that people in our culture make decisions about right and wrong. Okay, so I, this was, we went, I'm not going to go over the reading on this. We'll have plenty of time to take questions on that. What I do want to make sure of is that you're able to identify and can give me concrete examples of all of the various types of ways people think about right and wrong that we talked about in the reading. All right? I'm also interested that you're able to pronounce these things correctly <laughs> because if you can't, then we both look really foolish if you mispronounce those. So uh, we'll, we'll, what we'll do is it's, it's, a, it's a very quick, probably in about 30 minutes, what we cover in the philosophy program in a whole semester. Um, so we're going to get you know, basically the, the, the water skiing over large amounts of area uh, version of moral philosophy. But the way it cashes out is that they're, they're all good examples of the sort of the mixed bag way that people in our culture think about right and wrong. And the reason that's important is because I want you to be able to interact and engage the, your next door neighbor or the person who you work with not only on the issues that we talk about, but on how they get there, how they justify their position, and how, how do they approach thinking about right and wrongs when it comes to these issues. Okay? Because th those are what we call issues of meta-ethics, the way we justify right and wrong, because that's the place that opens the door to talk further about theology and about the gospel. I think what you'll find is that most people in our culture have not thought very much other than their intuitions about how to consider matters of morality. And so I just want, to, I just want you to be able to have your antenna a little bit better trained than they, might, than they are today. So that even you could, you could watch, uh, I mean, you can watch CNN when they talk about moral issues. And the people who are interviewed, you'll be, able, you'll be able to make some assessments. Now, this is, this is how he's approaching this. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's where we're headed with this. Then we'll spend quite a bit more time on specifically on relativism. Because that is so, is so pervasive today. And we'll use the Colson material on that. Because we've got that's a, that's a great session. I don't know if we'll get to that today or next time. Okay, you know there are, there are a number of different ways we could come at this, but let me let me let's start with this. I want to give you about two minutes with the person next to you or in a group of however many you want to answer the, this this question: Do you believe that we live in a secular society today? Okay. And then to defend either yes or no, and then defend why you think that's the case. All right? Two minutes. Go. Okay. That was just that was just to get us warmed up here for this. All right? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you believe that we live in a secular society in the United States? They would just use that for an example. Okay? How many of you believe that? Okay? Can you can you define that? I just point? hold on. Okay. <laughs> what? Okay. Don't I'm just taking this is just the okay. yes and no right. part. Okay? <laughs> All right. Anybody say no on that? Okay, so it's you, just one. Okay. All right. So you and I, I'm going to have to play the devil's advocate with you then. Uh, okay. Now, I recognize that this begs the question of definition. Okay. So maybe we'll start with, with this part. What, what, are, what, what are the identifying marks? For, for most of you that think we live in a secular society. We'll get to you in just a minute. Um, what are, but what are the identifying marks 
of a secular society. What are they? Obviously, you have some in mind. Okay. Although there's lots of, you know, I mean, they're in materialism, but I know lots of theocracies that are very materialistic. Okay. So I'm not, that's probably a, an evidence of overall general spiritual decline. I'm not sure that that necessarily identifies a secular society, though. You, you with me on the difference? Okay. What else? Indifference to spirituality, okay. That's probably where it's, it's gone. That's a good observation. Again, that might just be an indication of general spiritual decline, but it used to be, I think, that a secular society uh, gave, one of the components of that was that it evidenced hostility toward religion. Though I think today, hostility, you're right about this, I think hostility has become indifference to religion, where religion is simply a non-issue today in a lot of secular societies. Like, for example, I think it's really clear that most of Western Europe is a thoroughly secular culture. <coughs> it's not that there's overt hostility to religion until they make, until we religious people start making exclusive claims. But it's, it's more that it's a non-issue. Okay, so good. What else? Yeah. But we do see legal hostility towards religion. We see that in the True. courts. We see that in legislation. I mean, we, so I, I think that that hostility uh, is a <coughs> factor. And, and that... I, I Probably in the United States more so than I think in Europe. Right. But um. I, think, I think we're moving more and more towards secularization. I don't think we've completely okay. it's a good. That's a good observation. Perhaps we are on a secularizing trajectory, but not, ha not arrived at an entirely secular culture. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, that's a good observation. So what would be the components then of secularization, okay, and one of those would be increasing hostility, indifference to religion. What else? I was going to say a lack of uh, <coughs> affirmation in divine authority, or a lack of okay. acceptance of um, authority, I guess. We could say a loss of religious or divine authority, okay, all right, so what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, like, no one would, would say... I'm doing this because, you know, it says to do this in Scripture or, you know, God has, my religion tells me mm -hmm. to do this. Um, there's just a, yeah, a lot. That wouldn't be the first place people would go to. Okay. Whereas 200 years ago, you know, religious language and religious authority, I mean, all of life was shot through with that. Okay. All right. What else? Any other identifying marks? Yeah. This might be an outgrowth of hostility, but I would consider a loss of religious freedom. Okay. To be a sign of secularization. Now there, I think that's probably a, a, a mark that we've, you know, we're way over here and almost arrived in an entirely secular society. Either that or it's indifference. Now, those are two different manifestations. The democratic manifestation would be indifference, more the, the total, totalitarian manifestation would be a loss of religious freedom. Well, indifference would imply that people kind of gave it up, whereas the loss of freedom, it's being taken away. And people it's true, care. in a more of a totalitarian exactly. setting. Okay. Yeah, I think, ironically, um, even though Muslim theocracies are you know, about as unsecular as they come, uh, there's still a huge denial of religious freedom in those. You know. So I have to think about how to like, account for that. But I think your point's well taken, I think, in, in most contexts. Okay, good, all right. So, but, but essentially here, there's a loss of religious and divine authority, particularly in relation to morality. 
right? That morality has become sort of unhinged from its religious roots. Right? Now, I think that's true, again, when we're way over here. I think there's still a lot in the West that I would call a, a hangover from Judeo-Christian morality that <clears throat> that's, we're still you know, desperately holding on to because I, I think that some, the, most, the most thoughtful people, the most thoughtful atheists and postmodernists on this are scared to death of what to do about morality if they're right in terms of their worldview. Uh, and I don't blame them. Uh, because if I mean if it's true that you know, if the postmodernist is right and there's no such thing as truth and morality, uh, you know, then I, I think you know, God, yeah, God help us, right? I mean, in terms of having consistent moral standards, this is where then our discussion of relativism really makes a difference. Okay, that's a good observation. Okay, now. Let me give you a definition. It's a working definition of a secular society. And then I have a question I want to pose to you. Um, right here, a secular society is one, or this could be just as applicable to secularization, is one in which the following have lost their influence. Or in terms of secularization, are losing their influence. Okay. A secular society is one in which religious institutions, religious ideas, religious symbols, and religious leaders have lost their authority over the culture at large. It's one in which religious ideas, institutions, symbols, and leaders have either, either lost or are losing their influence over the culture at large. I don't think there's any doubt that we are on I mean, in one sense, that we are on a secularization trajectory. Right? Let me give you an example of this. About 10 years, you may remember, this was about I don't know, probably 10, 12 years ago, when, when they first cloned the, the, the sheep, Dolly. Remember that? This huge news that we're going to be cloning human beings a year from now, and you know, 12 years from now, we're no closer to doing that than we were in 1997. But we convened all of this, you know, this huge, you know, council was convened and they heard from all these interest groups and there were, I mean, all these religious organizations were represented in the, the NIH's panel, National Institutes of Health panel on, hum, on cloning human beings. I have the report that they have written in my office and there's a whole chapter on religious and ethical perspectives on human cloning. But if you read the conclusion, what they, what, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, uh, but what essentially what they say is that even though we live in a hugely diverse and religious culture, when it comes to public policy, no specific religious view can be the basis for public policy on because that religious views make claims about where their revelation comes from that not everybody has access to, or so they explain. And so what they require are what they call publicly accessible reasons for public policy that are explicitly independent of any kind of religious worldview or claim. Right? So, in other words, the whole chapter sort of, you know, nice of you religious people to show up, but, uh, you know, when it comes to writing the policy, if, if, if you don't have anything else besides your religious beliefs to bring to the table, you've got nothing. 
You've, you've got nothing of that. Nice to hear from you. Nice that you're represented. But in terms of the actual formulation of the policy on this, you basically check your religious views at the door, or if, if, you, bring, if you bring your religious views, if those are public, you, you, you better not lead with those. Okay, hold on just a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll here. Okay. Uh, okay. So what they said is that we acknowledge your religious views, but when it comes to the nitty-gritty of how this public policy ought to work, nice to see you. Okay. It's just why most religious people operating in public policy, sometimes you don't even know, other than their institutional affiliation, that they're a religious person. And my, the, my, 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 great, my greatest fear in engaging our culture is that we become so good at engaging the culture on non-religious terms that we would no longer be identifiably Christian, which in my view <clears throat> is somewhat akin to cutting off your nose to spite your face. And I say, that's, that's you know, if the reason for engaging the culture is to represent God's kingdom. Then I'm not. I'm not sure at the end of the day what we've actually accomplished. How, how can they make the claim that there's any representation of the of people with religious views if they're not going to pay any? If they're going to completely exclude them? I mean, that's <clears throat> well. They're acknowledging that there's a that there's a place for religious reasons but not as the sole basis for public policy. Okay? Now, in, in my view, just no, no additional charge for this, but in my view, requiring religious believers to check their theological views at the door is actually a denial of First Amendment rights of religious freedom. Right? Absolutely. Which, which you're essentially asking me to truncate my faith Actually, I think, the, I think the requirement actually goes a little bit further, which we'll get to in just a minute. Okay? Now, yeah. One more question. Mm -hmm. So if they're saying that uh, all religious frameworks and worldviews are not publicly accessible, what does that leave that is publicly accessible? Well, that's a, good, that's a really good question. It's any, anything that's not, that's not dependent on any kind of specific revelation. But I don't I mean what's okay. available. Not very much. Not very much. What would be, from a Christian worldview, what's available would be something akin to natural law, which we'll say a lot more about. But for the, you know, for the, just a general person in the culture, it's, you know, what you can reason out. Uh, and, you know, and for the cynic, it would be, you know, which they don't, put much stock in reason and rationality, uh, it would be basically what you can, what you can coerce people to do by, by the exercise of power, which that, 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 that can take a, a really ugly turn. Uh, or the, the, the milder version of that is, is what you can persuade people to consent to. Whatever they consent to, which... You know, is a, it leaves you with a really thin view of public morality, unfortunately. So, but basically, basically, it leaves you with a procedure for determining morality, but it has about that much content to it. Okay? Because the number of things that you can agree, get people to agree to consent to, is pretty small. Right? Now, here's the question. Oh, let me... I mean, why don't you think we live in a secular society? I, I don't disagree that we are. Oh, come on. Take a stand, uh, would you? What I said in the group was that, uh, was that I think when, when people, a lot of people have Christian or religious backgrounds <clears throat> um, in, in our society. And many of them still live sort of according to that worldview. But when it comes to things that they don't like and they chose to, not live by it. Okay. And so I think also another thing was when disaster happens in our country. That's a great point. A lot of people fall back onto that. 
uh, we see CNN reports and, and interviews. You have rabbis, you have priests, you have pastors coming up to they ask them to to give their opinion. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you know we're heading toward that direction. Hopefully it's not. Okay. But, All right. Yeah. Now, you, I, th I thought you might be anticipating my question. Okay. I mean, you sort of did. But here's, here's the question. For all of you who think we live in a secular society, how do you account for all of the people who go to church every week? There are, there are more people in church. Can't, I can't verify this, so, but, but so, so I heard somebody said somewhere <laughs> that, there are more people in church on any given Sunday in the United States and Canada than attend all professional sporting events for the entire year. Now, think, and, and all, all of our surveys tell us that the vast majority of people in the United States profess that their religious beliefs, not only do they hold them, but they're important to them. Okay? Now, we can quibble about the details on that. And, I'm not as, you know, and whether that's you know, whether it's a real thing or not, how you define a religious view, that's not really the point. The point is, however you define it, there are tens of millions of people in the United States and, you know, those of you that come from Korea and other parts of Asia, the numbers are huge there, too, uh, who claim that their religious beliefs matter and are formative for how they live their lives. Okay? Now, again, we can quibble with the consistency of that claim. Right? I suspect we can quibble with the consistency of that claim for all of us from time to time. So how, how do you account, this, and this may be where you, where you were headed with this, although we get, your point, I think we get periodic flashes of you know, national religiosity when 9-11 when hit, the churches were packed. Okay. Um, but how do you account for living in a secular society at the same time with this overwhelming percentage of what appears to be deeply religious people at the same time. Okay, syncretism. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, we have people that it's they're mixing they're they're mixing <clears throat> Okay, that's probably not the traditional notion of syncretism, really? but I know what you mean. I understand what you mean by that. All right. Yeah. Um, I think there's a big difference between wanting a knowledge and an understanding of God, going to church to do that, and then what you do when you leave 30 seconds later and you're in the parking lot no. and you're confronted with somebody. So it's the actions. That's right. You come that. out of church and the guy cuts you off in the parking lot and... Argh! Right, so you have that, and then easy. Don't do that. And then, and then we have what you referred to earlier is this moral relativism that's creeping into the lives of people that go to church. That's right. So, so they may hear a message that says right. this is the way we should behave if we're going to be like Christ, but then the effects of moral relativism kick in during much of the week, and people don't take their faith into okay. action. Okay, there's no doubt that that's true. Okay. That I mean, if if we if we if we lived out our faith the same way that the first century church did, our, I suspect our culture would look really different than what it does today. Although, you know, what and again, no charge for this. Watch out for the first century nostalgia. You know, I'm not. You know, I don't want to go back to Corinth and so, you know some of those places. Okay, so, I mean, it wasn't all, you know, roses and spirituality. 
But I, I think there's another explanation for this, that both our culture tries to squeeze us into and that we as a church have far too easily accommodate. And that's the second notion up here, that of privatization. The reason you can have an increasingly secular society and so many religious people is that they are fundamentally living a private faith without recognizing its public dimension. We, we, will, we will talk over and over again this semester about the social, public dimension of our faith. Right? Now, let me, let me just give you an example of what I mean by privatization. Okay? If somebody asks you, how's your spiritual life? What do, they, what do they really want to know? What is it? You've had people ask you this, haven't you? Or nobody pries into your business like that? What do they want to know? That's right. That's right. What, what about the other one? The other one was more along the lines of. <clears throat> okay. I think it's more the former, right, is what most people want to know. How is your private time alone with God? Okay. Which I suspect, I could be wrong about this, and forgive me if I'm under reporting it for you, but I suspect for most of us, that, that to accomplish 30, you know, 30 minutes a day on that, is, I suspect, is something that most of us would be delighted with. Okay. Now, what, actually, what's the right answer to that question? How's your spiritual life? If you think about it, if, I mean, if, if we really believe this idea that all of life is spiritual and we reject as we should reject a di that dichotomy between the sacred and the secular, right? If all of life is sacred, right? Amen? Okay, I'm just, just checking. Um, then the answer to the question, how's your spiritual life, would include things like really excited about school. God's doing great things in what I'm learning that in seminary. My work, uh, my work in my church is going terrific. My, you know, my, my marriage is flourishing if I'm married. My kids are thriving if I have kids. Uh, I'm, you know, I, think, I think even part of the right answer for, for that is that I'm getting regular exercise and I'm taking care of the temple of God's spirit. Right? Now, I, I think if you answered it that way, most people would look at you and say, but, you know, cut to the chase here. You know, how's, really, how's your time alone with God? And you see, you see what we've done with this is that we have reduced what ought to be this umbrella over all of life to what we do in, at, at, at best, sometimes 30, 30 minutes a day. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Um, now, here's what I want us to be careful about. Is though I am, I am all for everything that we are doing in spiritual formation. And I, I am convinced that our ISF staff do not intend for, for our spiritual formation to be, a, to be equivalent to a privatized faith. I'm sure that that's not what they intend. 
But I think the way spiritual formation is practiced in many of our churches has contributed to the further privatization of our faith. Now, our culture would be delighted if faith were entirely privatized. In fact, increasingly in our culture, that is the definition of the First Amendment that guarantees religious freedom, that it guarantees a private faith, that it guarantees your right of conscience, it guarantees your right to believe whatever you want. And that's as far as it goes. But the idea that faith could have a public and social dimension I think is becoming a foreign idea that most people in our culture think that's when religious views overreach. The idea that religious people might have something to say about the definition of marriage that would be expressed not only in public but even in the law. I think most people in our culture view that as a violation of the separation of church and state. This was probably 25 years ago when Ronald Reagan was running for president and and Walter Mondale, some of you guys weren't even even born at that time, but uh, Walter Mondale was running against him. And I I remember vividly Mondale saying in a speech countering Reagan's not only, I think, sincere religious faith, but also public faith, that he said the the founders envisioned that religion would be over here and would be between ourselves and our God. And the politicians would be over here and we'd never get the two mixed up. What Mondale didn't realize was that he just gave a textbook definition of a privatized faith. And one that I would suggest is truncated and accurate and right, but incomplete. And see, this is what I think, I think, one of the things I wish we would communicate more clearly to the people that we minister to is that their faith is not just a relationship to God. Your faith is a worldview. Your faith is a set of lenses through which you ought to see the world. And there are a series, and we'll, we'll talk about them all eventually throughout the semester, but there are a series of ideas that you commit yourself to when you come to faith. Now, you may not be aware of all those. You actually might, I don't know, some people in our church might actually take issue with some of the ideas that they've committed themselves to. Uh, but the, I, I, see, I think this, I, this idea that our faith is primarily a relationship to God often gets translated as it's, our faith is exclusively a relationship to God. And, th- and thus has no public or social dimension to it. And so we, we, we are, this, this is a mold that we are squeezed into by the culture, but a mold that I think we've all, all too willingly stepped into, if, if not in ignorance, voluntarily. Yes. Uh, this idea of privatization, I feel like it came out when our president um, had uh, sexual immorality in the conversations that went like his private life. Yes. It doesn't affect his uh, public function in office. Right. Right. No, that's a, that's a really good observation. When Bill Clinton had his, I take it you're referring to him and not JFK or 
others who the, the press just kept, yeah, where the tradition was the press kept that quiet. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the interesting part of that is when, you know, when, I mean, it's true. When people were asked, you know, do you, basically do you care about this? Does it make a difference how the president does his job? The answer was overwhelmingly no. But you know who they never polled? As far as I know. So I wonder what the White House staff would have thought about that. You know, they're the ones closest to him. Uh, they're the ones who, you know, watched the, this incredible risk-taking going on. Uh, and they're the ones who, you know, often had to pick up the pieces afterwards. Uh, but I think that's, that's an, an, like another illustration that we can segregate. We'll get to this when we get to, to business ethics, too. There are a lot of, lot of business people in our churches who believe that it's for church on Sunday, work on Monday, never the twain shall meet. Um, here's, if you've got, I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, this is probably out of print by now, but one of the most creative things that Oz Guinness ever did was called the Gravedigger File. Um, it's a, it's sort of, I say it's a, it's a poor man's screw tape letters. Okay? But it's really well done. And he talks about this privatization. He puts, it, uh, he puts it like this. He said, in terms, of, in terms of our Christian life, privatization means that the grand global umbrella of faith has shrunk to the size of a plastic rain hat. Total life norms, this is your point here, have become part-time values. In terms of Christian practice, watch your average Christian business person or politicians. Family prayers at home before leaving for work, private sphere. Bible studies with colleagues at the office, still the private sphere. Look for a place where the Christian's faith makes a difference at work beyond the realm of purely personal things such as witnessing to colleagues, praying for them, or not swearing, and not fiddling with income tax returns. Look for a place where the Christian is thinking Christianly and critically about the substance of work, about, say, the use of profits and not just personnel, about the ethics of a multinational corporation, not just a small family business, about a just economic order and not just the doctrine of justification. You will look for a very long time. Often, often, this person is regarded as being into religion in the same way that colleagues are into golf or into theater or into a score of other hobbies. Ray, Ray Kroc, who owned McDonald's until his death, claimed to be a Christian. The way he, I, he put this in really interesting terms. We'll see this again when we get to the, the, the marketplace. But the way he put this, he said, my priorities are God first, family second, McDonald's hamburgers third. And then he, the punchline. And when I go to work on Monday morning, that order reverses. I, would, I, think, I think what he meant by that is that he had one set of rules and one set of values and priorities for private life and the other for the workplace. And they were Almost entirely separate. Okay. The, 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 a couple takeaways out of this. Please encourage your people that, 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 that there, there's more, there is more to their faith than just their connection with God. Okay. Urge them to, to, to see their faith as, as, a, as, as a worldview a way of seeing the world. And you may have to help them clarify what those sort of fundamental ideas are that they've committed themselves to. All right? Yeah. I'm just thinking. Um, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if we have more of, a, more of a grounding in the Old Testament. Would we have more of a robust? That's a great point. The answer to that is yes. If we had more of a grounding in the Old Testament, would we have a more of a public dimension of faith? No doubt. Uh, no doubt. Now, we'll, in, a couple, in a couple class periods, we'll talk about sort of what happened to that. 
in the New Testament. I don't think it disappeared at all. Um, it just took a different shape. But in the Old Testament, this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but it, the Mosaic Law was intrinsically social. Right? It was not just a private moral code. For one, it was, it was given to the nation as a community, not to individuals. And it structured their institutions. It structured you know, how, how they ordered their life together. It was this whole life thing. And the, the purpose for that was so that the neighbors, you know, who, many of whom were you know, literally not more than a stone's throw away, could overhear and oversee how they structured their life together as a community that bore corporate witness to the reality of God in their midst. And it structured everything. I mean, and so the I, I mean, yeah, there was the, the Levitical system, the sacrifices, the festivals, but there was also the civil law that set up their institutions. It's a great point. Okay? Now, let me take this a step further because one of the consequences of the privatization that the culture has squeezed us into and, and into which we've accommodated is a changing view of what constitutes pluralism. And you've got to be aware of this if you start down this road of a pub, public dimension for faith. Right? Now, I know we're just using the term. We're going to spell out in a lot more detail what this looks like as the term goes along. But here's one of the places that it looks like. When, our, when, our, when the founders envisioned a pluralistic culture, What they envisioned was that you would tolerate and treat well people with whom you could, vi quote, violently disagree. In fact, what, the fa what, what pluralism actually set up was something akin to a free market in terms of worldviews. Now, over, they were overwhelmingly religious at the time. That's not, not so much true today. But all of those worldviews could compete for influence in the culture. And the state was explicitly forbidden from endorsing one specific worldview and making it the law of the land. Or even giving it privileged status. Now, that's not to say that the state couldn't have an interest in the general promotion of religion. The Founding fathers were very clear about that, that they did not envision a pluralistic culture working without being undergirded by religious slash moral values. So, what what pluralism meant at one point had to do with toleration, which again had to do with treatment. Right? So that, so that, I mean, you and I could, we could disagree uh, vehemently about you know, whether we believe God existed. But at the end of the day, that didn't affect how I treated you, the respect that I gave you, and vice versa. Okay. Now, today, that has dramatically changed. Where the view of pluralism today is that toleration has to do with belief and agreement. See, today, what it means to tolerate someone 
is what? It actually has nothing to do with how you treat them. What, is that? what does it have to do with? Yeah. Accepting, not necessarily agreeing, but accepting their worldview as equally valid with your own. Now, you see, you see this so clearly in the discussions about same-sex marriage. In fact, I'll, I'll bet, I would bet my last buck that the discussions that we will likely have in here about homosexuality and the way, and especially as we, as we bring out some of the biblical teaching, would, con- would constitute hate speech. If we, had, if we had that discussion at UCLA or Cal State Fullerton or you know, Long Beach State or a place like that. Uh, so it's, it's very different. Uh, I recall vividly uh, when, when Prop, Proposition 8 was being debated, uh, the, what was it, the placard they held, you know, don't hate, no on eight. Okay? As though disagreement and hatred had now become the same thing. I remember, I remember right in the aftermath of that, Joel Osteen. Yeah, so familiar with him? Pastor, he's, he's got this huge church in my hometown in, in Houston. Uh, and he's about as winsome a character as they come. He's, right, he's, um, right, you see, you see, he's about as non-offensive as they get. Right? And Larry, he was on Larry King, and he was being interviewed, and a number of things they asked him about was his view on same-sex marriage. And he, you know, took the position that mar- he believed marriage should be between a man and a woman, uh, and that the law should reflect that. And it was, I mean, it was, I mean, not a hint of antagonism. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was really well done. And his counterpart, he was brutally attacked by his counterpart. And I realized, you know, if Joel Osteen's getting attacked on this, we are, we are all in a lot of trouble. <laughs> because there was a, it was a really vivid illustration of how pluralism now extends not to treatment, but to belief. And the view that all worldviews can not only compete for influence, but are on the same level playing field is a view that I call intellectual relativism. So that to, be, to be pluralistic today, you can't say that you believe some cultures to be morally superior to others. Unless you know, unless you want to leave the room, you know, having been figuratively decapitated, and it's it's increasingly tricky to espouse public views without without being accused of being divisive or accused of being hateful. I just, I was turning left outside my neighborhood when all those folks with the placards were out. And I thought, I'm going to, I'm turning left here, so I'm, I'm going to go for it. And so I, I looked at a couple of those with the, you know, uh, don't hate, no on eight. And I just did this, that I disagree with that. Well, I mean, you, the, 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 it's a good thing my children were not with me at the time. Because the, the, le- the invective, the sp- oh, it was unbelievable. All the hateful things that they said to me. Well, and the, the, I suspect the irony was completely lost. Oh. I was thinking the person only the story came up. The, I tell my friends, the people I meet, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Very good. If you love me, I want you to tell me what you do. That's you right. Um, and I had a situation where I connected with an old high school friend through Facebook, 
and saw some things. I commented on it. So the way we treat mm -hmm. each other, I guess I'm operating on the yeah. toleration, but we treat each other. Just because I had a different perspective. Probably did, didn't, go, out, didn't go over real big, did it? It's so grieving to see that yeah. if you're only going to surround right. yourself right. with people that think like you and don't let anything else in, I think that's really dangerous. It is I dangerous. I tell her that, but she still has right. that. And see, what, the, the danger is, you know, wh what does this do to, you know, the public debate? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, I mean, I, you know, th there, there are some communities that have actually very skillfully insulated themselves from criticism in this way. Unfortunately, the Christian community is not one of those that's been very good at that. We seem to be a lightning rod for criticism. <laughs> but you can, you can see how you know, this, you know, this shift in the way pluralism is regarded uh, does, does not bode well for the debates that we're going to have to have in our culture over the next 20 years. We have, we have major things coming down the pike in our culture, most of which are, are fundamentally moral issues. Right? Things like, I mean, take things like Medicare and Social Security. I mean, those are fundamentally moral issues that are being debated. And we are going to have the mother of all public debates on health care, too, at some point. You know, at some, at some point, so, you know, people are going to get it that you don't try to impose a health care system without a substantial public debate first. You know, you don't pass the bill and then figure out what the heck's in it. You, know, you debate the thing first, and then you formulate the policy. Right? So, anyway, this, this, nah, just don't go there. Okay? Now, we just, let me, sort of the, the extreme... If you take this view of pluralism to an extreme, you get what I think is sort of fundamentally a, a postmodern view of the world that there is no, no truth, no and, no, and no morality beyond our own perspective. Okay, which means, which sort of cashes out for morality that essentially we make up our own moral rules for ourselves. Right? And just when, whenever anybody gives you that load of nonsense, I would, I, I would encourage you to, to do something that will make that person feel a victim of injustice. And see how they feel about you making up your own moral rules for yourself. I was speaking to a group of high school students on this. And, you know, they were giving me the same stuff. And the guy, somebody had, had a really, the guy had a really nice phone sitting on the desk. And I just walked over and I picked up his phone and put it in my pocket and just started going about my business, finishing the lecture. And I got up, you know, we, we were all done. And he assumed I was going to give his phone back to him, but I didn't. And he finally said, you know, can I have my phone back? And I said, no. But, but he said, but it's my phone. And I said, so what? I said, I said, I thought you said that we all make up our own moral rules for ourselves. And in the moral rules that I have made up, older, more experienced, wiser people are entitled to the stuff of younger, inexperienced kids. That's the moral rule that I've made up. So tough. Forget it. And you could, he, he could tell he was trying desperately. He knew I was playing him, but he was trying desperately to figure out what to say next. And I, and I basically said, you know, either you don't get your phone back or you've got to abandon that view. <laughs> you, you choose, but you can't, you can't have it both ways. Uh, now, t t I was bigger than he was, too, so, it, <laughs> so now it turned out to be really helpful. Um, but I think that's, what, that's 
part, again, part of the view of morality. So that when we talk about abortion, you know, people say, well, for one, they'll say, it's a, pri it's a private decision between me and God, or between her and God. Um, and, you know, any, any suggestion you might make that as sensitively as possible, that you ought to think about an alternative to ending this pregnancy, is often met with, you know, I make up my own moral rule for myself, which in the, in the abortion version of that is, it's my body and my choice to do with it whatever I choose. So, uh, we, we got we to be really careful with how we view sort of the, the, the enterprise of morality on this. And you know, please don't, don't, don't accept some of the culture's views of how we think about morality. We, these are things that, that I would like to see us challenge more often. Now, granted, you know, with, with, with teenagers and young adults who were raised in a largely postmodernist educational system, I agree that you have to approach them differently. You have to minister to them differently. I get that, you know, their story and their narrative is important, right? But I also get that this is fundamental. I'm trying to get my own church to get off this thing and balance it a bit. But it, it's, you know, it's God's story that's working itself out in my life. It's not, I mean, I don't own my, I don't own my story. God owns my story. And he is the one who's working it. But I, I wish we just say it like that. That would be good enough, I think, to challenge some of the postmodernism. But I think we have to, but, but in, as a worldview, that says, you know, there's no such thing as absolute truth, except maybe in mathematics, and there's no such thing as absolute morality. I think those are things we ought to be vigorously challenging as we minister to people who are coming out of this. Those, because I don't, I don't think you can hold to a, a, a biblically consistent worldview and be a postmodernist. In terms of your war, of your worldview, and and it, it seems to me, if that's part of the, you know, the the intellectual cross that we have to bear, then I, so be it. But I think we, some, we don't. Uh, sometimes I think we don't distinguish properly between, you know, the the methods we use to minister. And reach people who come out of. This, this postmodernist culture, and the tenets of postmodernism itself, right, which we, in my view, we ought to be vigorously resisting. Right, does that make sense? You with me on that? Okay. Um, all right. Now let's. Any any questions you want to raise on this before we leave it? Yes. No, there's, you know, so that point's well taken, that people do watch your life carefully, and in not only how you live it out, but the, the, the winsomeness with which you approach a lot of these sort of personal and controversial things makes a big difference. Uh, right? Now, if people are offended by our style, then that's on us. Okay? Or if people are offended by our hypocrisy, that's on us too. Right? But, but if people are offended by our position, and I think our task is to state this in as winsome a way as we can and not, not make enemies unnecessarily. But, but I think there are going to be some areas where, uh, where there, there are going to be conflicts. Um, but I think the, the point is, is right about, you know, you know, 
let's, let's do everything we can to approach this as non-offensively as possible. Um, and pe pe people do watch us. That's right. And people do get offended by the style. That's also right. And, you know, I've had, I've had to tell, you know, my own, my own kids that uh, certain, certain terms that are used that are very common among high school students for insulting their peers are no longer appropriate. Uh, and they don't, they don't even think twice about using some of these, what I would consider to be slurs, to insult their peers, all, all, in, all in, in fun. I said, you know, in, in my house, we're not, that, that's language we're not going to, those are F words in my, in my house. Uh, the, that's the equivalent of those. Uh, and so we've, you know, we've, uh, you know, we've had to watch some of that and be careful with that. And, you know, I think that's something you just got, you just got to stay at that. Um, and we've had, you know, there, there, are, there are some people out there who are doing this whose styles are really offensive. And, and they're, they, they're tough to choke down. And there may be some, you know, there may be some arenas in which they, they fit well, but they're probably not, they're, they're definitely not for everybody. So, I mean, I, I, thank you. That point's well taken. Yes? Looking at, at the four areas that you've identified here, there's not a linear progression. from. So what is the interrelationship among them? Well, t typically, the, this, I think, is the fundamental phenomena that's driving a lot of this. And I'd say these are probably all consequences of that. Okay. Um, so that as a result of secularization, you see a privatization of faith. You see a difference in the way pluralism is regarded. And then I think more of an extreme view of that, you'd see a, a difference in the way um, the sort of the fundamental worldview is conceived. Now keep. Keep in mind, too, uh, I think you can make a good argument that secularism is just as religious a worldview as Christianity, Judaism, or Islam is. In fact, it has all the earmarks of a, world, of a, of a religion. At least it's a worldview. There's no doubt about that. Um, and you know we should we should not let the, the secularists you know, uh, communicate the illusion that that their view is somehow value neutral. Which there's you know there's nothing that's value neutral in that way. And that's what I was wondering about with this public domain or this public accessibility. Why? Why can they claim that's that exactly. secularism is a publicly that's accessible right. worldview when uh, Christianity would not? That's exactly right. It's an, and that's a great question. And just if you want to read a little bit more about this, there's a terrific work by one of our colleagues, uh, Brendan Sweetman. It's called Why Politics Needs Religion. And he makes a very compelling case on just that point that sec secularism is just as much a religious view as any of the mainline religions. It's Brendan Sweetman, Why Politics Needs Religion. And, and again, none of this is necessarily suggesting that it has to be political. Right? I mean, I, there are, I'd say most, of the pro-life movement today, the public, the public expression of the idea that human beings are made in God's image is not political. So that when, you know, when, my, when my church sponsors a clinic for unwed mothers that are staffed or, and, and organized by three women who had abortions when they were teenagers, 
and have committed themselves to helping young women not go down that road. That's a public expression of their faith. When, you know, when you're with the physicians that you're with, you know, treating them with dignity and respect, you know, that's a public expression of your faith. When, when, we, when, when, when as pastors we walk with families through the end of life uh, and encourage them that you know, maybe it's okay to say enough to medicine, that's a public expression of faith. Now, it's also true that when John Thune, who's a Biola grad, you know, unseats, you know, Tom Daschle for, in the United States Senate, that's a public expression of his faith, too. Right? But God's not calling everybody to do that, for which I'm grateful. God's not calling all of you guys to do the same stuff that I'm doing, and vice versa. You know, the next time we get an assisted suicide thing on the ballot or in the legislature, you know, I'll probably be out there, you know, speaking to physicians and hospitals, you know, that I think that's a, you know, that's a bad idea. That's a public expression of the idea that, you know, all human beings have intrinsic dignity by virtue of being made in God's image. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.